Hello, boys and girls and your families. Welcome to this week's Sunday School lesson. We are going to be studying more today about the Ten Commandments. Before we start, I want you to go ahead and go get um, your Bible because you'll need it today. Always need your Bible for Sunday School. Once you run off and get that, come back. Maybe you have it already. I hope, hopefully you do. And then we're going to take a moment to pray together before we start. All right, let's pray. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for your word. Thank you that you have given us guidelines to follow so we know how to please you with our lives, so we know how to act and become more like you with each day of our life. Thank you for all that you do for us. Be with us as we look into your word. Help us to understand it and help us to follow you better because we have looked into your word together today. Amen. Okay, today we are going to talk about the seventh commandment. The seventh commandment, if you look on your banner that you will have at home, tells us you shall not commit adultery. And I was a little concerned when I looked at the title of the lesson um, a couple of months ago when, when I got my materials and I thought, hmm, how am I going to teach that to boys and girls? But um, the lesson plans have been written well and God's word shows us exactly what it is that I can say to help you understand that commandment. What I would like you to do first is to take a look at two pieces of wallpaper that I have. So here's a piece of wallpaper and here's a piece of wallpaper. So if I were to call a girl to the front and I would say, which one of these pieces of wallpaper would you choose? I wonder what she would think. Hmm. Or if I would choose a boy to come to the front of the room, if we were in our Sunday school class and say, which one of these would you choose? they would have different ideas. I think most girls would probably choose this and they might say, well, it's because I'm a girl. Oh, it's because I like pink or I like to dance or this looks more like a girl wallpaper. I like to pretend that there are fairy tales and um, I like to read fairy tales. So they might pick this one. Maybe a boy might say, well, I like trucks. I like to build things. I like to go and move. It just depends. But the reasons that either a girl or a boy would choose whichever wallpaper would be telling you something about them. It would be telling you what they're like. If a girl said, I chose this wallpaper because I like to dance, you would know something about that person. If a boy said, I chose this wallpaper because I like things that help build, you would, you would know something about that person. And God gives us his word so that we can know more about him and more about his character, more about what he's like. And he gave us the Ten Commandments so that we can become more like him by obeying them. So as we look at each of these commandments, and we're the whole way up to the seventh, we have 10 commandments, and we're at the seventh already, um, we should be figuring out a little bit more what it is that God wants from us to help us become more and more like him. <clears throat> we're going to talk today um, first about a verse in Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 7, 9, and here's where you will need to get your Bible. So I want you to take your Bible and we're going to look this verse up. If we were in class, we would do a sword drill and we'd hold it like this and I'd say, draw your swords and you would open it. And you're going to look up Exodus chapter seven, verse nine. I'm sorry, forgive me. Deuteronomy chapter seven, verse nine. So Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. You're gonna look up Deuteronomy seven, nine, go. Okay, hopefully some of you have it. Let me read it to you. 
Know therefore that the Lord your God is God, the faithful God, who keeps his covenant and the steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations. All right, let's talk about this verse a little bit. It says that those uh, that God is faithful. What does faithful mean? What does that mean? Faithful means that God won't break his word. He will not take back what he says. He won't break his promises. What is a covenant? The covenant is the promise, the thing that God has said he will do. Know therefore that the Lord your God is God, the faithful God, the God who won't make promises, who keeps covenants and steadfast love. Steadfast means it keeps going, it keeps going, it keeps going. That God is steadfast in his promises and in his love for us. And um, he, he will keep that for forever and ever and ever. It doesn't change. All righty. I want you to think about some examples of faithfulness. If you think about everyday living, think of somebody in your life who is faithful, who keeps their promises. I'm going to stop for just a second. See if you can talk to the people in your house. Say, who is it that keeps promises? Stop right here. Okay, what I thought of is a couple of things. I thought about the moms and dads or moms or dads or grandparents, whoever it is that goes out to work each day so that your parents can uh, pay for you to live in your home. They can buy groceries. They can make sure you have sneakers when you need sneakers. They can make sure that you have money to pay for electricity or food or anything that you need. That person who goes out and works has to be faithful. They can't go to work for three or four days and say, well, I've had enough of that. I'm going to take a three or four day break and then go back for two days then take five days off and then go back for a day and come back. They have to be faithful. Whatever their job requires of them, if their re job requires that they work Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, they have to go every day. They have to be faithful to get a paycheck. If their job is that they have to work Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, Sunday, that's what they have to do. They have to be faithful. Pastor Sam has to be faithful to come to us every Sunday and preach the word. He doesn't say some Sundays, you know what, I had a tough week. I'm just not doing that this week. We're going to let somebody else get up there and just go ahead and talk to you about God. No, he has studied. He has been faithful. And then he comes Sunday and he preaches the word to us every single Sunday thought of another example in God's word of somebody who was extremely faithful, even to the point where his life was threatened. That was Daniel. Daniel was told, if you don't stop praying to God, you're going to get thrown in a lion's den. Did he stop? He didn't stop. He didn't care that somebody else told him to break God's word. He said, I'm going to be faithful. So God is faithful. As faithful as our parents are, as faithful as Pastor Sam is, as faithful as Dan was, God is way more faithful because he doesn't mess up because he's God. He's perfect. Parents mess up. Pastor Sam, we don't think you mess up too much, but Pastor Sam is capable of messing up. Um, Daniel definitely was human, so he messed up. So we have this God who doesn't mess up, and he's faithful. He keeps his promises. He's steadfast in his love. He takes care of us. All righty. Now, I want you to look at one more verse. I want you to take your Bible again. And this time, oops, looks up. So I, it looks backwards when I look in the screen. I don't know if it does to you or not. I want you to look up Psalm 94, 14. Psalm 94, 14. I'll stop and you look it up. And we're back. Psalm 94, 14 says, for the Lord will not forsake his people. He will not, excuse me, for the Lord will not forsake his people. He will not abandon his heritage. 
That means he won't give up on us. He won't. He won't turn away from us. He won't say, I'm done. I'm just done. He will continue to be faithful to us. I want you to think about um, what the people said when Moses told them about God's promise to their people, if they would obey him and keep his covenant. So we need to go back a little bit. Let me um, read the promise to you. In Exodus 19, four to six, this is what God's word says. Moses said to the people, you yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians. So he's, Moses is telling them what God's words are. You yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples, for all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the people of Israel. So God told Moses, Moses told the people, and what did the people say? Do you know? In Exodus 19.8, it says that they said, all the people answered together and said, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do. We'll do it, God. We're going to follow you. We are going to follow you. Did they do that is the big question. So what we're going to do right now is take just a little break. And all of you have your discussion questions that you will look at with your parents. And the passages today are kind of big. So it'll take you a little while, that's okay. So there are three large passages, and I want you to think while you're reading them about um, what was Israel like, how were they described in these verses, and what was God like in these verses? And we'll take a break right there. You've read the passages, and the big questions are, how were the Israelites acting? What were they like in these passages? Were they faithful to God? Did they do things against God? They did. It says that they did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, and they served Baals. That means they served idols. So they did that. They looked at all other different kinds of gods. They bowed down to them. They provoked the Lord to anger. Um, in one of the other passages, it says their hearts were not steadfast. They weren't faithful toward God. They tested God. They made God angry. They tested God. Um, and it was almost like they didn't remember that God was their heavenly father. But what did God do? Did he just say, forget it. I'm done with you people. You have not been faithful. Did he do that? He did not. He was faithful. <clears throat> and that last part of scripture that you read, Psalm 106, 43 to 45, it says many times, many times, he delivered them, but they were rebellious. That means they did the wrong things. They were rebellious in their purposes and were brought low through their iniquity, through their sin, their evil. Nevertheless, he looked upon their distress when he heard their cry. For their sake, he remembered his covenant, his promise, and relented according to the abundance of his steadfast love. In other words, even though he was angry, even though he was frustrated when they got themselves into trouble after sinning and they cried out to him over and over and over again, he would relent. That means he would go back and he would say, oh, okay, I love you so much. And I've made a promise to you. I'm going to be faithful even though you weren't. Wow. And that is the difference between God and us. We're sinners. We mess up. We forget to be faithful to him. He never forgets. He is faithful. I have something really special here. I've had this for 
almost 39 years. Do you know what that is? That is my wedding ring that Mr. Humbert gave me when I was just a young girl and we got married and he was saying by giving me that ring that he was making a promise that I would be his love, his sweetheart for the rest of his life. I gave him a ring too. His ring's a little bigger than mine, a little thicker, but he gave me this ring as a promise. See how it's a circle, it doesn't end, it doesn't have a beginning, it doesn't have an ending. It goes one and one and one. And that was a promise that he made to me. I want you to look at another interesting verse that relates to this. I want you to take your Bible again. And this time I want you to look at Isaiah 54, five. Isaiah 54, five, that's in the Old Testament. So go ahead and look it up. Okay, we're back with Isaiah 54, five. Let's read it together for your maker, and it has a big M, a capital M, which means it's a proper noun. That means it's naming somebody. So who is your maker? Do you know? It's God, right? So for your maker is your husband, the Lord of hosts is his name, and the Holy One of Israel is your Redeemer. The God of the whole earth, he is called. So God is like our husband. He has given us a promise that he will love us. The way that Mr. Humbert loves me as his sweetheart is different than the way that God loves us because Mr. Humbert's a human. He doesn't have quite the ability to love as deeply or as steadfastly as God does. God's love doesn't stop. He's the husband to his people. He is a faithful husband who will never leave his people. He'll be faithful to his promise to be the God of his people. He will never take another people to be his people because God is faithful. So if he would get fed up with us, he wouldn't say, I'm done with you. That's it. I'm going to go find another group of people to love. No, because he's faithful. Okay, so here we go. One more verse to look up in your Bible. This time we're looking up Exodus 20, 14. Exodus 20, 14. This is the seventh commandment if you're keeping track on your banner. And it says... You shall not commit adultery. Hmm. Committing adultery is not being faithful to the person you're married to. Wow. Adultery. That's kind of a, an adult word. It's a word that grown-ups know about. And it's a difficult one, perhaps, for children to understand. So let's talk about it a little bit. So... It would be like having another family living next door to you and your mom or dad would take the mom or dad from that house out to dinner instead of your, so say the dad would go next door and say, I'm gonna take my neighbor lady out for dinner, but not my wife. He would be committing adultery. He wouldn't be faithful to his wife. There, there um, are certain things that married people do together that are only within marriage and you can't just go do those things with other people. You are committed to that person. I am Mr. Humbert's sweetheart. So he's the only person that I kiss. He's the only person that I give big hugs to. Um, I'm the only person he takes out to dinner. We don't ever drive with other husbands or wives alone in our car. We shelter our marriage because it is a commitment before God, that should last forever. So we have to be very careful to honor our commitment to one another. God's commitment to us is kind of like that, except bigger, because he's God and he's perfect and he does it better than we can do it, but we try really hard. Um, Israel didn't do that. As we read in those passages in your discussion time with your family, the Israelites didn't do that. Did they stay faithful to just God as their God? No, they went after false gods, gods that didn't even really exist. They were made out of wood and stone and they committed adultery to God, spiritual adultery 
because they weren't faithful to God. Because that verse in um, Isaiah 54, 5 says, God's our husband. He's our spiritual husband. We have to be faithful to him. They weren't. So they committed spiritual adultery. So there's, there's two kinds of adultery. There's this um, more general adultery, the idea of being faithful, especially with God. And then there's the specific one where we're unfaithful as a husband or wife with somebody else's husband or wife. Some of you might have experienced that in your families. And if you did, it's really hard and it's really sad. It breaks your heart. It breaks God's heart when families break apart. But that's not God's plan. So how does that fit for you guys as little kids? Because you're just you're kids. You're not married yet. Well, you can start to be a faithful person now. You can begin as a five-year-old or an eight-year-old or a 10-year-old or however old you are to be a faithful person and learn how to be committed. You can be um, faithful by thinking about the things that you watch and not making your mind think of things that aren't pleasing to God. You can be faithful in your friendships. You can be faithful in um, your family relationships. And as you begin to practice being faithful, you will become the kind of person who will understand how to be faithful in a marriage and how to be faithful to the one true God. I'm going to show you another picture just to give you an idea of what I'm talking about. So here is a picture of a bicycle. And here's a bicycle. We like bicycles at our house. Isaac has a really nice bicycle that he got for Christmas last year. And he is allowed not to let anybody else ride it. There's some things at our house that we say, you don't have to share that. Most things we share, but some things you don't have to share, especially your bicycle. What if Isaac had his bicycle outside and he's riding around, which he does a lot, and all of a sudden, another kid would come along and they would take his bike and they would say, this is my bike, you can't ride it anymore, it's mine. And he would say, no, it's my bike. And they said, no, it's my bike, you can't have it anymore. And then they would say, not only is it my bike, but I'm going to kick the wheels till all the spokes are broken and twisted. And then I'm gonna take a pair of scissors and puncture the tire. I'm gonna wreck your bike. I'm gonna make it look like a piece of junk. What? How do you think Isaac would feel? I know how he would feel. He would be really upset because it's his. It's his bike. He picked it out. He got it bought for him. He takes care of it. He makes sure it's not out in the rain. He makes sure it, the kick stands down so it doesn't fall. So he takes care of this special thing of his. If somebody else comes and messes it all up and makes it into a piece of junk, he's gonna be so upset. That's what I'm talking about when we talk about protecting our family or protecting our relationships. When husbands and wives are married, nobody else can come and take the husband or wife away. They're committed, they are, they belong in that marriage with that man or wife. <clears throat> so here's another one. See this, what's this? An egg. Mr. Humbert got this fresh from our chickens yesterday. So I'm gonna take this egg and I'm going to break it. Now it's in this nice pretty bowl. Can I put the egg back together? Nah, kinda, but it's kinda cracked. You know, it keeps collapsing. The special parts of it that we use for nutrition are in this, even though it's a beautiful bowl, they're in there and I can't do anything about getting them back in the shell. I broke it and made a mess. When husbands and wives commit adultery, that's what they do. They break this perfect thing, dump up out all the good stuff and make a mess. And even though if they try to put it back together, there still hurts in our hearts. So another example of what committing adultery is like. 
Um, I'm going to stop here for a second and we're going to go ahead and take a look at our second part of our discussion card, which is um, provided for you, 8B. So we'll stop right here and we'll be back in a few minutes. Okay, we're back. Now, in this particular passage in Matthew chapter 5, verses 27 and 28, it says, you have, you have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. Notice that in Exodus, that's in the Old Testament, Matthew's in the New Testament. They're not two separate stories. It's one big long story that continues. And in the New Testament, often the Old Testament is quoted or referred to because the people in the New Testament were living out the things that they would write about. But the Old Testament was the scripture that they already had. It's important to know that all of the Bible fits together. It's an important entire story. So Matthew 5, 27, 28. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with a lustful intent has already committed adultery with, his heart, with her in his heart. Lustful intent means wanting a person to be like a husband or wife to you. So it goes back to some of those examples I gave. If Mr. Humbert would go next door and want to um, take the neighbor lady out for dinner, or if I would go and meet somebody different, some friend who um, was somebody else's husband and say, oh, let's, let's go have a special evening together. That would be really, really wrong. But it's also wrong to even have thoughts and attitudes about other people's husbands or wives because we protect our marriage. Just like I talked about with the egg, just like I talked about with the bike, protecting our marriage and making sure that it stays complete and pure before God. I have one more example for you. I have a nice white shirt here and I like to crisply press white shirts at our house. This is Isaac's Sunday best shirt that he wears on special occasions. It's nice and white clean, pressed crisply. So if he decided that he wanted to go out and take a look at the garden, which he does every single day, and he says, I want to go out and take a look at the pumpkins, how big they are. Would he go out in the muddy garden with this white shirt on, do you think? Good idea, bad idea? Bad idea, right? Um, what if we said when we came home from church, we're having spaghetti, salad, and garlic bread for lunch. And you sat down and think about how you eat, all of you five, six, seven, eight, nine-year-olds. Spaghetti with a white shirt. Good idea, bad idea. Bad idea. Because it's so easy to slop it. I am 57 years old and I slop spaghetti on my white shirt. So it would be a good idea to protect the shirt put a cloth over it, take it off and put a different shirt on. Um, you would do whatever you needed to protect your nice white shirt if you knew your mom wanted, had, had it all nice and crisp and clean for you and wanted you to be able to wear it other times. You would not try to mess it up. And that is what I mean when I talk about protecting our marriage. You do whatever you have to do to keep your marriage protected and safe and just for the two people who exchanged the special rings so that you can have a forever marriage. And like I said before, learning how to be faithful starts now. It's not something that you have to wait until you're an adult to do. You can start to be faithful to your friends, faithful to your family members, and especially faithful to your commitment to God. Faithfulness is really what um, learning how to not commit adultery is. Because if you become a faithful person, in little things, you will learn how to be a faithful person in big things like marriage and most importantly of all, faithful in your relationship with your Savior. If you don't know Jesus as your Savior, if you think, how can I be faithful to God? It's more than just reading your Bible. It's more than just praying. It's saying that ultimate prayer of asking him to be your personal Savior and saying, I know God that you sent your son Jesus to earth so that he could die on the cross for my sins. And I take 
that death on the cross and his resurrection as an act to cover my sins. I want him to be my savior. If you don't know how to do that today or you haven't done it yet, I would challenge you to ask your parents or when you're at church, ask any of the adults that are your Sunday school teachers um, or people that you know you can trust there and we will be glad to tell you how you can learn to be faithful to God through salvation with this son, Jesus Christ. I hope this made sense to you and it helps you understand a little bit more about the Ten Commandments so that you're thinking and as you're growing older and you're remembering, this is how God wants me to be as an adult. I hope you have a wonderful week. Thanks for watching. Have a good day.